Good evening and uh, welcome to our Robertson School Speaker Series event uh, with a panel discussion about what just happened, understanding the 2020 presidential election results. And uh, thank you so much for tuning in with us. We know uh, there's a lot going on right uh, this moment. So we're very excited uh, to have you with us. Uh, my name is Marcus Messner and I'm the director of the Robertson School of Media and Culture here at uh, VCU. So what a week it has been so far. Uh, we're two days after the presidential election and we still don't know who the next uh, president will be. Uh, president Trump uh, claimed victory already uh, during election night and uh, Joe Biden made it clear yesterday and today uh, that he sees himself on the path to victory um, as well. Um, the future of the country depends on just a few battleground states, especially Pennsylvania, Georgia, Nevada, and uh, Arizona. Uh, we're very excited to welcome four of our Robertson School alumni uh, for a discussion about what is happening right now, uh, what influenced the election, and where we go from here. I'd like to welcome Sergio Bustos, um, a 1984 graduate who is regional manager of Report for America, a nonprofit organization that seeks to strengthen local newsrooms uh, over his career Sergio worked for various news organizations, including the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Miami Herald, Politico, USA Today, and the South Florida Sun Sentinel. And he's also graciously lending his time uh, as a member of the advisory board um, of the Robertson School. Welcome, Sergio. Thank you. Uh, I'd also like to welcome uh, Chandelise Duster, uh, a 2010 uh, graduate who works as a politics reporter at CNN Politics in uh, Washington, D.C., not too far from here. Um, and prior to joining CNN, she was a reporter at NBC, uh, where she worked for NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt, uh, The Today Show, uh, Morning Joe, and numerous other shows. And she got her start right here in the Temple Building at VCU Insight. Welcome. Um, Michelle Hankerson, a 2013 graduate, is a reporter at WHRO uh, in Norfolk. Uh, before joining the public broadcasting station, Michelle worked for the nonprofit startup, uh, the Virginia Mercury, to cover state government here in Virginia, and for the News and Observer in North Carolina and the Virginian uh, pilot. And she got her start here at the Commonwealth Times uh, at VCU. So welcome, Michelle. Thanks for having me. And last but not least, we welcome Derek Waller, uh, also a 2010 graduate and a classmate of uh, Chandelier's Duster. They were in VCU Inside together. Uh, Derek is a reporter for Eyewitness News and this morning at WABC TV, the ABC flagship station in New York City. Uh, Derek worked for TV stations in Cleveland, Ohio, Raleigh, North Carolina, and in Charlottesville here in Virginia. Um, Derek was also one of my first students here at the Robertson School, and it's always great to see our students uh, succeed and welcome them back to share their um, success story. So welcome back, Derek. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. Um, during our event today, um, you, our audience members, uh, you can post questions in the uh, Q&A function here on the Zoom webinar. Um, you can also comment on our live stream on our Facebook page, uh, or you can tweet um, on Twitter by using the hashtag um, VCU. Uh, Robertson. Um, we will be uh, getting to your questions shortly and we'll try to get as many of your questions um, into our um, panel discussion, which will last uh, about an, an hour. Um, I want to start out uh, by talking about your personal um, election uh, experience and uh, how you've covered the campaign and uh, how you've been holding up since the beginning of the week. I'm sure it's been uh, quite uh, a wild ride. Um, since election day. Uh, Chandelise, uh, do you want to give us a little glimpse into uh, how it was uh, or how it's going at uh, CNN politics? Yes, well, it is very busy, as you can imagine. Uh, I normally work in the mornings, so I, my day normally starts around 5 or 5.30, and then I'm on at 6 a.m., but I've been getting up around 4, getting maybe about 3 or 4, uh, hours of sleep. Um, I'm not too much of a coffee drinker and it's uh, the fall so I love chai latte and I'm actually <laughs> drinking with my second one right now. Uh, but it is busy. It is um, things are still fluid where we are and things are changing and it's a lot of reading. It's a lot of uh, 
looking at the magic wall that we have <laughs> um, with our team of reporters and anchors um, and our also our decision desk, just getting everything in and trying to report the facts and be factual. So that's that's kind of how my election week has been so far, eating a lot of junk food. I'm eating um, Halloween candy, Tootsie Rolls is my guilty pleasure. Uh, had uh, some Chipotle, some chips and queso for breakfast, Pop-Tarts. Sorry, mom, I'm not eating as healthy as I should. Uh, but yeah, taking naps and not sleeping, but taking naps. So that's how things are going with me. <laughs> Speaking of uh, of getting up early, Derek is up early every morning, um, mm -hmm. and uh, he covers uh, pretty much, I would say, everything that happens in New York City. And of course, a lot happens there. But you've also focused on the pandemic quite a bit, and and on the election. I saw that you were, uh, I think, on Times Square yesterday or today. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little bit about how you're covering the election in New York. Well, yeah, exactly. So I do the morning show. So I actually have to be at work um, every day at three a.m. And that's been a little easier, frankly, with the pandemic, because we're not going into the office. So they're actually picking me up from my home. So that's another 30 minutes of sleep right there. But every minute counts. Uh, this week, so Tuesday, we obviously covered the election. And just like most uh, local TV reporters across the country, we were at a polling place. But because of the pandemic, New Jersey is doing something that a lot of pit places are doing. They actually have this one giant central polling place at a at a um, at an arena at the Prudential Center, which is a home of a, a hockey team uh, used to be the New Jersey Nets. Uh, but it's a huge polling place, and so we were there, started the day there, and very few people were actually showing up there. Well, that's because New Jersey encouraged mail-in voting and actually sent everybody in the state a ballot. So that wasn't a surprise there. Pretty. Uh, mundane there. Wednesday, we were in Times Square. And that was just uh, because, you know, Times Square often sees protests. If something happens, you know, people go to Times Square because everyone knows what it looks like. Everyone knows where it is. It always gets national attention. You have media outlets there. So Times Square is the place to go if you're expecting something to, to happen. So we covered the Biden campaign from Times Square in the morning. It was very peaceful. Nothing happened. Uneventful until last night. So this morning we were down in Greenwich Village, uh, the, the arch in Washington Square Park. A lot of people know what that is if you've ever visited New York City. And it's right by NYU. And that's another spot where protesters like to uh, show up. And uh, there were some protests last night, some peaceful protests about uh, counting every vote. Obviously the president has been challenging the uh, vote counting. So that was going on. But then later on into the evening, as that kind of sputtered out, you had some of the anti-police protesters who started showing up. And, and, and that's been a, a common theme across the country that uh, these guys kind of show up when it gets dark out and uh, start you know, causing problems. So uh, there were more than 50 arrests last night. So today we actually had something exciting uh, you know, to talk about on the news this morning. Uh, you know, unfortunately, there was, it was a little bit of violence, not as bad as we've seen. But uh, yeah, that's how my week has been going. And uh, I'm ready for the weekend. <laughs> uh, Michelle, you're the one here here in Virginia on the ground uh, in, in our home state uh, here. What's your experience been like? So I'm I'm really lucky. I don't have to wake up early every morning because I'm not a host. So I don't go on air live usually. Um, Tuesday, we did send out, we're a really small team. Um, the journalism department at our station just launched. We're a really small team. So we focused on local races and statewide referendums because we are also an NPR affiliate station, meaning any news about the presidential election would come from NPR in DC. So we didn't really have to worry about that. Um, but we did go out first thing in the morning on Tuesday um, and we stayed online, working, checking things until 11 um, Tuesday night, which is when here in Virginia, they stopped counting ballots for the day. So it's, it was a long day. And then the next, uh, the next day, Wednesday was um, not an equally as long day, but still a long day. And so today we finally slowed down a little bit, but um, because the presidential race is so up in the air, we, we don't really know what's gonna happen. Virginia was called really early for Joe Biden. So we're not, we're not really in play as they say, but 
you know, there's been a lot of talk about potential for unrest following results. And so that is something that everyone has to um, kind of keep their eyes out for. Mm -hmm. okay. um, Sergio, you are overseeing uh, um, or you're working with uh, various local newsrooms uh, uh, here in the Southeast. So um, what's your what's your experience? What you're hearing from uh, from from the newsrooms that you're working with? Yeah, I oversee about 35 newsrooms in the South, about 52 reporters, and uh, you know we were expecting a closer vote in Florida. That would have been a a big thing for the reporters. But as as the other panels have noted, uh, you know unless you're in Arizona, Nevada, Pennsylvania, Georgia, uh, or North Carolina is where the action's been. And that's exactly what it's been here. North Carolina has been very hectic because that's been a close race. And it's just been standing around waiting. The reporters there just waiting for uh, any movement as opposed to even a decision or, or like, same thing in Georgia. You know, that, that number keeps creeping closer and closer as Biden inches up. Um, overall, I just recall my own experience. I covered the 2016 campaign for the AP. I was a reporter in 2000 during the uh, uh, Biden, uh, Biden, during the Bush Gore uh, bizarre, bizarreness. In fact, I was in Florida at the time and it does remind me of Florida, but six times Florida. Uh, it's, you know, Florida, remember it was decided by 500 some votes. Uh, it looks that way in Georgia, looks that way in, um, in, in North Carolina, looks close. I think Pennsylvania is gonna come down to a close one and, and looks like Nevada and Arizona are just as close. So instead of one Florida 2000, you've got six, seven uh, states like that in 2020. Um, what can we expect in the in the coming hours and uh, and days? What's kind of like the timeline that that you expect until we have certainty, if you can even say that? As far as I as far as I can see, like I said, I think there's a repeat of 2000 in terms of the legal fight. Uh, Trump is, in, uh, you know, his lawyers have lodged some complaints and some some lawsuits in certain states. I expect that to grow as we get nearer and nearer to uh, a decision. Okay. Uh, Michelle, it looks like um, Joe Biden has a lead right now. At least he's closer to the uh, 270 in the Electoral College and just needs to win one more state to win the, the presidency. If you count uh, Arizona into his corner, like some of the news organizations have done. Uh, does, does President Trump still have a promising path uh, to be reelected? Mathematically, if, if we're counting Arizona for Biden, no. He could win um, Pennsylvania, Georgia, North Carolina, and he would still not be able to make up that the lead that Biden has uh, when it comes to electoral votes. Now, if Arizona shifts, if if um, AP has to retract that call, um, yes, Trump could Trump could theoretically still win. And and back to the one, if he you know if Arizona stays with Biden and Biden gets gets Nevada. Um, Trump has said and has started the legal process in several states. So that is another possibility if he can force recounts or whatever he may ask for in some of these key states. Um, but I wouldn't call that the easy path to winning. I would say that's kind of the more difficult way to get there. Okay. Um, uh, Chandelise, uh, both Sergio and Michelle already talked about the legal challenges, um, and, uh, and I'm sure you at CNN, you're reporting ab about that. Um, from what you see, um, are there any um, legitimate concerns that the votes um, are counted incorrectly um, at this point? Uh, what I can say is from what we know and from what secretaries of state so far have uh, reported, uh, from what we've heard, no. Uh, from uh, the Secretary of State that spoke a couple of minutes ago. It's, it's been several press conferences going on and I keep looking at my phone to see if there's anything else that has come down the uh, pipeline while we've been on here. Uh, but um, they've all said that they are uh, working hard and that things are looking to be secure and that they are doing the best that they can to make sure that everything is fair and everything has been counted. But from unless something is out there that I have not seen, um, there is no, as of now, there is nothing that, that I've seen that would suggest that there are votes that are not being counted at this moment in time. Mm -hmm. I would and just then, remind you all of hanging Chad's 
uh, butterfly balance. And that's where yeah. things are going to get interesting. When they, you start to get into the, into the weeds, I mm -hmm. think, and you start looking at each ballot, that's where I think Trump is going to try to make a challenge. Mm -hmm. So can you imagine a scenario where Biden wins several of these remaining states and there's still a legal challenge? Or do you think if, if, the, if a win is decisive enough, then this will all die down? Uh, I don't want to get into hypotheticals because the race, you know, we mm -hmm. haven't called the races in some of these states. And I don't want to, it's so many numbers being floated around and it's like a number soup at this point. And, and, you know, we, we don't want to confuse anyone, but I mean, from what we are seeing with the Trump campaign, uh, you know, there are several lawsuits that are out there. Uh, the president has tweeted that um, they would and indicated that he would make challenges. So as what we are seeing right now, are they basically throwing things at the wall, so to speak, um, in terms of uh, some of these challenges? Yes, I mean, and it's not anything that, that is a surprise, right? This is something that we, uh, we would expect from the Trump campaign. He has said during the election that, you know, he has made baseless claims about fraud and, uh, you know, massive voter fraud with no evidence. Uh, he has indicated that he has felt that the election was rigged. So seeing challenges uh, that are coming out of this is no surprise from the Trump campaign. But I don't want to get into hypotheticals and say that if, if it was to be this way, it may go this way. Uh, um, or if he didn't do this, maybe it would be this way. But this is, this is what we are seeing uh, right now. Okay. Uh, Derek, we see a lot of misinformation, some might uh, call it, uh, again, fake news, um, that is spreading on social media. You know, we're, we're already getting used to that or have been gotten used to that over the last couple of years. But uh, these, uh, uh, this, this uh, spreading misinformation, misinformation, misinformation leads also to some uh, protests that we're seeing now about Sharpies, about ballots being picked up in a, in a van, and, and everything right. turns out uh, to be false and, uh, and unreliable. Um, how can people determine what's factual and, and what's not? That's a great question. And, you know, to that point, today I even, I tweeted a video. There was at a news station in Detroit, WXYZ, that uh, there was a, a video that some uh, uh, conservative website in Texas uh, had put out showing uh, a man with a, with a cart hauling a box of something into the polling or the voting center in Detroit. And the news station had to come out and say, you know, that's actually our photographer taking his camera equipment in. And so that's what's so dangerous about social media is that anyone can just put this out there. And, you know, they say, you know, a lie spreads a lot faster than the truth. And that there, there you have it. So how many people saw that video, shared it, and then how many people saw the truth later? Probably much fewer people saw the truth. So to answer your question about how do we get back to, um, how do you know, you know what to trust? I mean, I think it, it's, we have to go back to the basics and you know, number one, media outlets you've heard of before is a, is a great place to start. I mean, we, part of the population doesn't want to believe the mainstream media, but it's mainstream for a reason how do we get people to trust that the mainstream media is telling the truth? Maybe that's a harder, harder question, harder hurdle there. But I mean, the answer is that we have to go back to, to the, the sources of information that have been trusted for, for decades, because there's a track record, you know, we have training, <laughs> we have editors. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, if you've never heard of the website, that's, uh, that's obviously a, a giant red flag. Mm -hmm. I think it's as simple as that. Yeah. Um, I'd like to uh, remind our, our audience that you can post questions in the Q&A function here on the Zoom webinar or on our Facebook live stream or tweet uh, on Twitter with the hashtag uh, VCU Robertson. Um, Sergio, a lot has been said about the Latino vote and how more Latinos unexpectedly, somewhat unexpectedly, um, voted for Donald Trump, especially in Miami-Dade County uh, down in Florida, uh, close to where you are. Um, why was Trump so effective um, with Latino voters? You know, I think uh, basically uh, it's a couple, couple of factors. Number one, I looked at the numbers and there's a lot made on this narrative about uh, the, the Trump campaign's socialist 
label on Biden and uh, Kamala Harris. It's true, it affected folks specifically in Miami-Dade. But on the other hand, if you look at the numbers, he turned out more than 1 million more voters in Florida across the state. Mind you, Biden turned out 500 some thousand. So the turnout here went from nine, 9 million or so to 11 million. But who got the bulk of them? Donald Trump. I think that was a big, big uh, turnout, big thing that affected him. And again, I think the other thing that America is going to get, uh, at least American media, is going to get a little lesson on is that uh, the Hispanic vote is, is, has never really been understood very well. At the end of the day, you know, somos Puerto Ricanos, somos Venezolanos, somos Cubanos. We're not somos Hispanics, you know, and, and I think to understand that we are Venezuelans, we are Puerto Ricans, I want you to go back to the end of the last century when Irish, uh, Italians, um, you know, uh, the British, uh, you know, folks came over from Europe. We didn't call them Europeans. We called them Germans. We called them the Irish. We called them, uh, you know, Italians. Even the Italians, we called those from Northern Italy, those from Southern Italy. They even identified themselves from towns. And I think uh, the American media has finally learned that the Latino in America really identifies by country of birth. And I think once the campaigns understand that, they'll be able to tailor messages. So I got to say, Trump, um, the campaign, was very smart in tailoring a message to Venezuelans and Cubans who dominate uh, Miami-Dade. And that's, that's what resonated. And to, to, to take that a step further, Biden just didn't come up with a rebuttal, even though the Trump administration has been deporting Venezuelans, deporting Cubans under this policies, under his policies. If I can just jump in on this too, um, in addition to the fact that, especially when you consider Cubans and Venezuelans and, and Trump using this message that Joe Biden is a socialist, that's going to really make them second guess maybe an automatic inclination to vote for Joe Biden. But I think it's important to remember if we, um, if we do just look as Latino voters without breaking down nationalities, um, Latino culture, is, especially first generation immigrants, um, they're highly religious and, and many of them are, well, I, I think it depends, but they're highly religious. And, and we know that the Republican party sells itself as the party of like Christianity of religion um, I've talked to a lot of Latino voters who the only reason they go out to vote is when it, about abortion and it's, it's tied to their religion for them. And so um, that is to me like a very low hanging piece of fruit, like a very easy thing to understand. But I think even that in, in a lot of newsrooms and at a lot of news organizations, people don't always make that connection. Um, religion is very important to a lot of Latino cultures, and we know every other group of people that plays into political behaviors. And so that is the same for Latino voters as well. Just had one quick thing. Yeah. Most Latinos in, in the United States came here after the 1980s. So they weren't witnesses like my own family that saw the civil rights movement because we came in the 60s. So we saw that fight for equality among us. So, and by and large, Latinos still are, are mostly, they're going to vote Democrat, you know, 60, 40, you know, Bush in 2004 got 40% of the Latino vote. But as to uh, Michelle's point, um, the Latino vote is very, very much up for grabs if they can tailor a message, but again, to certain groups, you know, and, and the biggest group of all, Mexican-American, you never see an ad necessarily tailored just to them. Mm -hmm. uh, Chandelise, um, Trump has also made some inroads with uh, black voters, especially with black uh, men, it, it seems. Uh, what if Trump's message worked with uh, black voters and uh, how much did the Black Lives, Matters protest, black Lives Matter protests uh, play a role in this election? What I would say first is about the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, we still have early exit. We have early exit polls, and there's it's still 
yet to be determined, you know, how much an effect that has had, considering the fact that, like I said, votes are still kind of being counted. But what I thought was particularly striking looking at exit polls is when you look at what was the most important issue among voters, uh, it's seen in early exit polls uh, that we have is the economy. And Trump has had a very, very strong message about the economy. Now, the argument on, you know, how he has done with the economy, whether, you know, looking at how, what economy he came in with versus how he's handling the coronavirus pandemic, that is a conversation that for a, an entire other day, right? But when you look at what he has said about the economy, uh, I, I'm, to me, I'm thinking that that really, really had an impact. And I also thought it was striking that when you look at his voters, voters who voted for him and voters who voted for Biden, co the coronavirus pandemic was not a top issue. And, you know, the, I, that kind of struck me off a little bit, you know, considering that the coronavirus pandemic has disproportionately affected Black people and other people of color. But the, the main issue among people was the economy. And when you look at what President Trump has done, um, you know, during the pandemic, you see that uh, what he has said about the economy, you know, there is the back and forth between the White House and Congress on the next stimulus uh, uh, COVID relief bill uh, that, you know, those talks have seemed to have stopped for now. Uh, you know, Trump was trying to negotiate and try to, you know, and come into uh, Cong the White House was coming to Congress uh, to up go up on the money a little bit and those negotiations continued. But at the end of the day, there was a stimulus check of $1,200 that was ultimately approved that went out. So when I, when I think about Trump's message with the economy, that was a strong, that was very strong. And then when you look at how during Trump's presidency, he has really, really targeted African-Americans. He has targeted black people, even when he has falsely claim that he has done more for black people since Abraham Lincoln, uh, you know, in, in his message there. And then uh, looking at who he has actually had his black surrogates that are really have really been pushing the message. Some people know them, some people don't. You have Pastor Daryl Scott, and then you have Diamond and Silk and all of these other people. And, you know, when you look at what he did in 2016, he didn't get a big swath of the, of the black vote, but he did get, he got some. And so now you see that he's gotten a little more than that. It's curious to see how he did that considering his, he's had his messaging of, uh, of how he's touted himself as a law and order president and how he, you know, has said things about black lives matter and how he has said things about, um, uh, the national anthem protests and a whole bunch of other things, how he has attacked uh, Senator Kamala Harris, a woman of color. Um, but I, I believe the economy um, hit home uh, and or some voters were looking at his, re his record or what he has said about the economy. And then you also got to think about, for me, I think the bigger question is, what are Democrats not doing that would make Black people and people of color vote for the president? That was a, one of my top questions. And I think the Democrats really, really need to think about that, considering that they say that Black people are the back, back bundle of the party. Well, now you really got a lot of soul searching, even more soul searching to do than before when you look at when as once we come out of this and we have the race called and we have the final uh, exit polls and really look at what the voters were saying, what were some of their top concerns and how that fared with Biden and how that fared with Trump. I know that was a long answer, but I wanted to kind of <laughs> take that out just a little bit. Right now, that was also <laughs> a, a good segue. Uh, let me get to a couple of questions that here. The first one is uh, from Dick Robertson, the namesake uh, of, uh, of the Robertson School of Media and Culture. Um, uh, Derek, uh, let me give this one to you. He's asking, how can we ever again trust the accuracy of political polling now that the last two presidential campaign predictions were so incorrect? I, I, I wouldn't. <laughs> That's my question, answer. I don't know. I mean, I don't know how you look at the last two election cycles and say, okay, 2024 
is going to be different. I don't know how anyone could say that because even our own, I'll call it our own network, ABC, the ABC Washington Post poll last week had Wisconsin plus 17 for Biden, 17 points up for Biden. So obviously, whatever metric did, uh, or method they were using was completely wrong. I don't know if people were lying to pollsters or they had the wrong methodology. I don't know, but something has to change. And frankly, I don't see what they could do uh, to change people's minds in 2024 because, you know, Biden, it looks like he might still win this, but it's going to be very close. And it's not going to be the 10 point margins that all of these polls were saying for, mm -hmm. you know, the last year. So frankly, I'm not sure. I think, I think in 2024, they're going to have to be accurate. And then maybe in 2028, people might trust them. But I mean, two election cycles in a row, they've been completely off the mark. I, yeah, I think it's, it's not a good situation. You got to vote. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Michelle, here's another question uh, from an attendee here in the, the Zoom webinar. The situation this year made it clearer than ever that there is a critical need for robust, secure postal service. How can we protect future elections from internal and external threats? Mm -hmm. I think um, post-2016, there was a lot of attention on external threats to elections. And so there has been a lot done in not, uh, not at a national level, but if you kind of look into what your state elections administration has done, they've probably strengthened some of their practices. Now, internally, when we're talking about our own agencies and how they might create a barrier for voters, specifically the Postal Service. I think the Postal Service is just something that we as Americans have taken for granted for a really long time. And we never saw ourselves being in a position where we needed that to like carry out our democracy. So I think that this may be the thing that changes people's perspective. And this may be the thing that gets people talking and putting pressure on lawmakers to um, take care of the Postal Service. I don't know how many people in here um, live in Richmond or did live in Richmond, but if you did, and if you lived off campus, you know, you know how frustrating it can be when the Postal Service doesn't work right. So I think Ooh. this, <laughs> this is something that I think everyone in the country has seen. And hopefully that will mean at least a discussion about what, what the Postal Service needs for us to better function, not just during elections, but just to have that service as Americans. Okay. Um, Derek, um, we're seeing a huge split between urban and rural voters uh, in this country, which seems at the core of why we are all so divided um, on political issues. Um, why do New Yorkers turn their back on a Republican like Donald Trump, who is a longtime New Yorker himself? And, uh, right. and it's one of the hotspots of the pandemic. Um, how has the president <laughs> the handling of the COVID-19 pandemic played into that? Oh, those are interesting, interesting questions because I feel like number one, uh, I think New Yorkers have known Donald Trump for a long time. Most of the country knows him from the celebrity apprentice or the apprentice. Um, but before that, obviously, he was very well known in New York. So I think New Yorkers know who he is, and I'll just leave it at that. Um, as far as the when the rule the rule divide and the city divide, it's interesting you say that because I know that obviously the storylines have been that the, the suburbs have been trending bluer across the country, and we've certainly seen that in the suburbs of, of Richmond. I mean, I grew up in Chesterfield County, and if you could, if you told me that that was going to be blue you know, in a few years, I wouldn't have believed you because the Chesterfield that I grew up in was deep red. So there's that. But here in New York, it's interesting because Nassau County, which is the first county uh, east of New York City on Long Island, that's like the first suburb on Long Island, that's always been blue. And it's further east you go out that it starts to get more red. This year, it actually went for Trump. So that actually got more conservative. So there's been actually the opposite effect. And I think it's an example of our polarized culture. So New York City is getting more deeper, deeper blue, more entrenched in, 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 uh, in with more entrenched in that, in that respect. And then just outside the city limits, they're getting more conservative. So everyone's 
you know, people aren't, I don't know, people aren't talking to each other. It really bothers me. But um, as far as the coronavirus pandemic, I mean, here in New York City in the, in the spring, you saw the news. It was as bad as it looked. I mean, you heard sirens all night long on the street. And, you know, once we finally were able to go back outside, and I, went, I remember going for a walk one day in the hospital two blocks up, they've got those trailers, you know, the, the temporary morgue that they got backed up to the, the hospital. And you don't realize what it is until you think about it. And you're like, oh, that's what that is. That's why those refrigerators are running in the back of the hospital. So it was just very bleak. And the fact that he downplayed the coronavirus, I think uh, did him no favors here in New York, but you know, he wasn't going to win New York anyways. Mm -hmm. Right. Very difficult territory for Republicans in, uh, in uh, presidential politics. Um, Michelle, um, in, uh, in Virginia, as it's, uh, if you look at the map of Virginia, a lot of uh, rural voters in, in, in the countryside of Virginia, they're turning their back on Democrats like uh, Joe Biden. And uh, um, why is that? And uh, how, how much um, uh, does the economy and uh, the successes that Donald Trump uh, had before the pandemic uh, struck. Uh, how much does that play into that? So I will say, I think the tendency for Western and like Southwest Virginia to vote for Republicans is it's a vote for culture, not necessarily politics, because there's there are very few politicians, Republican or Democrat, that that do anything that really helps Southwest Virginia as like a whole region. I will say, I think what appealed to those voters in 20, 2016 for Trump is his promise about the coal industry, about protecting coal, about um, reviving the coal industry. There were still a few mines in Southwest Virginia. People relied on them. They were good jobs in an area where like the best jobs you could get was like being a teacher and having like a favorable shift at Walmart. Um, there's the, the economies out there just aren't working because the coal industry is not like it used to be. And they heard Trump saying, I can fix that, I can do that. Um, that I would argue did not materialize in the last four years. In the last year or so, several of the mines have shut down out there. Um, several of the companies that own the mines have filed for bankruptcy, leaving people in the lurch without paychecks, um, without back pay that they're owed. So I don't know if that is as strong as a message as it used to be, but we see that's the reason I think we still see that going red is, is more about culture than politics. Like I said, um, Southwest Virginia actually used to vote blue and there was a shift kind of like, I wanna say in the late nineties. Um, I think recently that shift has to do with gun policy and legislation and just kind of ingrained conservative ideals that have that have taken kind of the headline of the Republican Party, right? Um, it's not necessarily about individual policies for some of those voters. It's about a promise of like a country that they're familiar with, that they're comfortable with, that they like. And I think that's one thing that Trump did very successfully in 2016, is he sold this idea of a country that he was going to create, you know, make again. And I think that idea was one that really appealed to the rural voters in Virginia. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, um, you know, allow me a, to editorialize a little bit here as a, someone who has come to this country from abroad and didn't um, grow up here. Um, and uh, of course the election in the United States plays a big role internationally. And, um, and a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, the people on the international stage look to the United States and really can't understand why there is this edit editorial, uh, electoral college. And so the electoral college seems to be a little bit outdated um, to elect the leader of the most powerful country in the world. Um, it has also shown that a candidate um, can gain the presidency with a minority of the votes. Um, you know, if you look at uh, Al Gore, um, and George W. Bush in 2000. So she talked about that a little bit. Um, Hillary Clinton received more than 3 million votes, uh, more than Donald Trump. Uh, Joe Biden seems to be getting even a bigger difference um, uh, in this election and still could, uh, could lose the election if some of these battleground states um, go the other way. Um, Sergio and, and Chandelis, um, can, you ever, can there ever be a serious attempt to change um, the election of the president to a popular vote? Or is this forever caught up 
in partisan politics where one side, in this case, the Republicans, will always feel disadvantaged by any change to this. Uh, I'll go quick. Uh, you know, I was when I worked on the editorial board in Fort Lauderdale on Sentinel, um, whenever there was a story about the Electoral College, we got a deluge of letters on both sides. And to me, it's like gun rights. It's like capital punishment. It's like abortion. It's one of these issues that there is fierce arguments on both sides. But I do think um, it's growing more and more of something that we may revisit, but it really would be a big hurdle to challenge and change something that was born so many, so long ago. Yeah, and, and what I'm gonna add to that is, um, first I'll say anything is possible, uh, but, and as was just said, um, you know, there it is one of those things where both sides are really ah, about it. Um, but I think it's important to look at uh, how the Electoral College started um, and, and look at how it uh, is stained with slavery. And I won't go into that, but just kind of look at how that started. And when you think about the Electoral College, uh, there has been attempts uh, in the past um, to try to change it, so to speak. Um, I think it was three times if I think about it, like a long, long, long time ago. But you got to think when it comes to the Electoral College, it is deep in, embedded into the Constitution. And when it comes to anything trying to change the, the Constitution, there will be hurdles and it will be difficult. There are, there was a poll that was done, I believe it was in 2018, where there were a lot of Americans who support um, changing the Electoral College. And uh, there are also uh, uh, some Americans that, uh, you know, would approve of just going to the popular vote system. Uh, I think if, if the Electoral College was to be changed or to completely just be abolished, it, it, it's a lot, it's very, diff it's very complex and looking at the states that would technically benefit from it the states that would not. So there were, you would have some states that would lose power. Um, and then you could even, I mean, but you could have some states that would say, you know what, we wanna just prioritize the popular vote and just do away with it. So it gets murky and it's messy, but my simple answer is anything is possible. Um, but I, I think it's, one would really have to look at uh, how that would play out um, in terms of, of uh, trying to change that. I would add that it's, it's a sad thing in America that, you know, everyone's, everyone knows the mantra, the saying, one man, one vote. And I'll add one man, one woman, one vote. Um, but, you know, it's, what's unfortunate is that's really not true in a state like Maryland. It's completely democratic. You know, it's not true in a state like Kansas in a state like, uh, you know, Utah, they're going to vote Republican. So if you're a Democrat in those places, your vote really doesn't count. I hate to say it. You really matter if you live in Florida, where I'm at, or if you live today, Arizona, Nevada, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, those states. But think about it. Most of the country is just sitting on the sidelines watching the elections. And where do the candidates go? They're going to go to the swing states. They're not going to show up in the other states. I think that's a sad state of affairs, and it, it's understandable people would feel left out. Mm -hmm. And and then there are people, as you were saying, that will feel left out. And then it, it makes people question, uh, you know, the power of the vote. Um, if everything is just going to be determined by this elector system that has, and when you look at some states. Um, that has the amount of electors, you really question, you know, well, what is that about? <laughs> um, you know, you have, you know, and if, if, if the way that it is determined by the districts, um, you know, so there's, there's a lot of arguments to go around. And then there's a lot, not saying that either side has more concern about the other, but um, it, it is to be questioned. It, it is to be questioned. Okay. Um, uh, Derek and uh, Michelle, um, Sergio just uh, mentioned that, you know, that, uh, you know, if you're a Republican voter in certain states like New York or Virginia, 
um, you know, you uh, there's a very likelihood that your vote does not count that much because it's these four states. New York has been traditionally blue, um, but Virginia has been uh, solidly blue over the last decade or so. Um, do you feel that in your reporting when you go out um, and, and talk to people? Are they less rallied up, less anxious, less motivated? Um, because they know that it's hard for them to to turn um, four states red in a presidential election. Do you, do you I, I will say in Virginia, I don't think so. Um, I think that um, Trump supporters here have been really enthusiastic, even at the polls. Um, I, I don't know if that's a function of, you know, when we talk about like red and blue states, normal people don't think about politics like that. They just think about like, Am I good? When I go, am I voting for a Democrat or am I voting for a Republican? Most people don't think about like, is my state a Democratic leaning state like every other day of the year, you know? Um, and so I think Trump supporters felt like Virginia was still winnable. Um, but so I will say at the polls on Tuesday, they were still excited. They still showed up, they still had their flags. Um, they were very happy to talk about why they supported him. So I think in Virginia, because it feels like the shift to, to, not, to not being a battleground state happened so recently, they feel like they, there's still a chance to shift it. And of course, there's always a chance to shift a state, um, but obviously it, just, it wasn't this year. <laughs> Yeah, you know, growing up in Virginia, again, it was uh, not a battleground state in the other direction up until 2008. And then, you know, two cycles later, it's considered completely safe, safe blue. So it's really remarkable how quickly that's happened. Uh, as for New York, I will say I have the uh, experience of, you know, being worked, I've worked in Virginia, North Carolina, and Ohio. So in 10 years, of being a professional reporter. This is actually the first election I've worked not in a battleground state. And the difference is is striking because you know we don't see any presidential ads on TV and unless you're watching maybe on cable news because they'll do national ad buys, but uh, you don't see any of that. You don't see it on social, well, little on social media, but uh, you're not inundated with constant reminders of the presidential election living in New York like you are in Ohio, in North Carolina, or even, or even Virginia. Having said that, I did feel like there was still enthusiasm to get out and vote. There are other, are other races on the ballot. Um, we also cover a, a very large area. It's the biggest market in the country, not just because of New York City, but it's geographically huge. We have all of Long Island. There's a half of New Jersey, um, parts of Connecticut. So we're all over the place. And, and maybe, maybe it's because I am all over the place and I talk to uh, different people um, I get a sense that people are interested in the race. I could be, um, I guess, uh, biased in that way because I'm, I'm talking about a lot of different things and not just focusing on one area. But I do think that people are interested in voting even if we aren't a battleground state. And I thought this year especially, and also another thing, I'll, one last thing is that because New York is New York, again, I mentioned the protest that people like to go to Times Square. Uh, it, it attracts attention just because it is New York and there's all the media is here. So you do have that as well. Thank you. Um, let's turn our attention to January 20th, um, when the new president will be inaugurated. Um, Michelle and Chandelise, uh, what could we expect from a reelected President Trump? How would a second term for President Trump look like? Oh, uh, well, I don't want to get into hypotheticals here because <laughs> the races haven't been called. But I will say that um, regardless of who ends up um, on Inauguration Day, um, whether they're standing outside or it's somewhere else because we're in the middle of a pandemic, they will have to deal with the pandemic. And that's just the, the bottom line of it. Uh, you know, we're, we, a pandemic is here and it's not just in the United States, it's all over the world. So that's the only thing that I can say, unless something miraculously happens within the next couple of weeks, they will have to deal with the, with the pandemic. Yeah, I would say that is something that will be on any president's plate. I do think something that will happen if 
President Trump is reelected is there's there is his first term has built a lot of um, resistance among certain people in our country. And so I think those people will feel that they need to act on their feelings. And I don't necessarily mean violence or anything like that, but I do think we might see in our, in like our lives as normal people, um, more activism just in general, um, because we, we see that gaining momentum even now toward the end of his term, his first term. So uh, I don't know if that means Trump will double down on some of the things that people will be concerned about or if he will be a little more receptive to critique. I don't know what that means, but I do think for us, we will kind of see some of that pushback toward President Trump in that second term if it happens. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, Sergio and Derek, how would you see that for a potential uh, President uh, Biden if he wins the election? How would, how would his presidency look like? You know, um, you know it's interesting. I, I think uh, he's, he's well known to a certain extent, but not by everyone. But I think President McConnell uh, I'm talking about Senate Majority McConnell, and I say jokingly president, but McConnell's going to have a lot of power if, in fact, he stays as Senate Majority Leader. He could really put a, 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 a stop to everything that Joe Biden would want to do. So you might see a very paralyzed uh, Washington, which would be a bad thing for the country, as uh, Chandelise and Michelle talked about. I mean, I, you know, the pandemic, I mean, as Chandelier's mentioned earlier, there are folks that feel the pandemic is secondary to the economy. They voted for Trump. There are people that feel the coronavirus was a priority and they voted for Biden. Um, it's hard to see how you're gonna implement like say a national mask mandate if McConnell might be opposed to it. I think he actually might be in favor of it, but mm -hmm. there'll be many clashes on so many po policies that I think, again, people may be forgetting that McConnell looks like he's gonna stay in power. It's interesting you say that, and I agree with the principles, everything you said, but I will add this, that obviously Joe Biden was a Senator for many years, and these, pe these two men have a long relationship. And so, you know, there is something to be said about working with people that you've known for a long time and have worked together, worked with together. And have, and I'm just trying to be optimistic here. I, I do think that there is an opportunity, um, you know, to, to, to work together on something, given that uh, these guys have been around a long time. So I, I don't disagree with the fact that, yes, it's a fact that Biden and um, McConnell have known each other a long time. But this is about politics, and I think politics has become extremely, much like the nation, very divided. And I think either side giving in to the other. Compromise is just a dirty word these days. I hope, Derek, that's exactly what happens. Uh, my, my, my pessimistic side says, I won't believe it until I see it. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. No, but I, I agree with... Uh what what you said about the uh, the Biden term. I mean, I think that a lot of people were expecting the blue wave and uh, we're gonna have, you know, uh, public option or Medicare for all, and we're gonna uh, raise taxes. Expansion of the Supreme Court. Oh yeah, so many Definitely things. dead and, in the water if McConnell's I mean, there. All of, that is, all of that sounds dead to me, but um, maybe at least they'll get something done on coronavirus relief. But I mean, even that, I don't know, it does seem a little bleak. Yes, and let's go and let's really think about this blue wave. There was an expected blue wave. And, you know, today Democrats are looking like, you know, what happened? And, uh, you know, they lost the seat. You know, yeah. there is no majority takeover at this point. You know, the it's House gonna be hard leadership to is going to look time. the same. And let me tell you, there, yeah. there was a, I, I think what's fascinating that Biden's going to have to, to do something is forget the blue wave. There was a black wave in America. I was up till three thirty in the morning on election night. You know, the next day, you know, essentially waiting for Milwaukee 
the city of Milwaukee. Milwaukee, the city proper, which again is a black city, ended up turning the tide for Biden. And what are we waiting on tonight? Philadelphia, that's a black city. Atlanta, mm -hmm. that's the capital of black mm -hmm. America, you know? Yes. Um, and he may even have to go out in Phoenix, I'll have to look at the numbers, but the Latino vote there may have turned the tide in, in Phoenix. And in Texas, mm -hmm. it looks like the, the Mexican American vote might have helped at least bring that closer. But I think he's gonna have to, to do that because remember what saved Biden's presidency. You know, he was mm -hmm. he was dead in the water until the black black vote, which is huge, South Carolina, came to his rescue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I totally agree with that, especially when, you know, once it's all said and done, really look at, um, you know, again, I want to get into hypotheticals, but really looking at how black people will pull, um, have, how they could pull for Biden. And, and when you also really, really think about, uh, you know, it's an interesting dynamic there. We'll have, a, we'll have to have a part two to this, uh, <laughs> Professor Mesner, but it, um, it's an interesting dynamic. I agree with what all of you um, have said, and, but don't, but let's remember he has a black woman and a woman of, you know, a woman of color who is his running mate. So let's not, let's not forget that. We got to think about that too. A very good transition. It's actually a question I have um, before we get at our final outlook on where we go from here. Um, it's, got, it's been something kind of like uh, uh, almost like forgotten in the all discuss discussions of the of uh, the election, who's going to win and, you know, drilling down into the counties in Arizona to see where the votes come from. Um, you know, if Joe Biden um, is elected president, it's going to be pretty historic because uh, um, Kamala Harris is going to be the vice president. She's going to be the first woman in that office. She's going to be the first African-American woman, uh, Asian-American woman in that office. What's the significance of that for the country if it were to happen, Michelle? Well, I think anytime we have like the first of anything, it, it's significant. But I think... Um, Talking a little bit what Chandelise has mentioned, it's a great thing. I think people will be really happy to feel like they're represented in such a high office. But I do think that Kamala and, and Joe are going to have to reconcile the fact that normal people of color do actually want to benefit from that, right? Like if they see someone like themselves in an office, they want to see that person advocating for them. If you remember back in the Democratic primaries, one of the big critiques that um, Harris got was her um, prosecution record mm -hmm. and how it seemed to disproportionately affect people of color. It appears that voters have moved past that to, for the most part, but I think people of color will be watching her specifically in this administration um, to see what really are they doing to help me. I think people were really, really happy and excited about President Obama, but I do think at the end of eight years, and I don't know if this is a, if this was a, a messaging failure or if it's just something, you know, out of President Obama's control, but I think some people of color, especially the ones that ended up voting for President Trump, looked at their lives at the end of Obama's two terms and said, well, nothing's changed for me. I thought he was in office and he was going to help me and nothing's changed for me. So I think if, if Biden's campaign was able to get those voters to vote for them again this time, they're really going to be watching them to make sure that they deliver on some of these promises. And ideally, if, if Joe wants to run for a second term, he will have to deliver on some of those promises, which could really change public policy in the United States. Just remember the like Democratic Convention. To, oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. Go you ahead. know, at the Democratic Convention, you know, uh, Biden and his campaign uh, basically blew off the progressives. Alexandra Ocasio Cortez, who I will argue myself, when I first saw it, like, man, this woman's a firecracker. Uh, but I'm not sure. But as I listen more and more to her, I'm saying, you know what? She's speaking with a big group behind her. 
you know, and and I think the Democratic Party does itself in a, a, a disservice by not keeping those folks out. And I think what Michelle and, 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 and she was probably saying too is, you know, yeah, that's great to have a, a black Asian woman in such a powerful position. But let me tell you, the VP is usually pretty symbolic, but I think people are gonna wanna see, see action from the VP. In other words, she takes command of certain policy issues, you know? Uh, I know Biden said he doesn't wanna defund the police. We're not saying defund it, but come on, let's do something. You know, and they're going to expect Kamala to take that leadership role and Biden in some way to step aside because if they don't see that, if they just see you just put up a, a, a woman here who happens to be black and is Asian and doesn't do anything, then the people are going to be pretty ticked off, I think. And I just want to add to that, and I agree with what you both have said, uh, you know, in terms of Kamala being a woman of color, black and Asian. Uh, looking at her background and where she's come from, you know, it's 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 extraordinary to have a woman like her uh, in that role and, and is one of the highest offices in the United States, especially looking at her roots from an HBCU, um, even to her uh, beloved sorority of Alpha Kappa Alpha. Uh, I'm in Delta Sigma Theta sorority, which is another uh, predominantly Black sorority, just like hers. Um, really rally, rallying um, the uh, fraternity and soror the black fraternity and sorority sororities and um, really pulling that up and um, that's really energized uh, a lot of uh, black people uh, and it's interesting one of my colleagues did a story about the fundraising efforts uh, that have been done for Kamala um, but she is going to have to, uh, you know, her record as a, a prosecutor is quite, you know, she is questionable. Um, and, you know, you know, people aren't really forgiving, but people are forgiving. Um, but she is a senator. She's been, you know, she's had the experience. She's done this before. Uh, and, but she does have to rise to the occasion. But um, it is going to be a lot of energy for that, especially seeing when there are young women and young girls of color, when you see somebody the representation in a role like that, that really is significant. It really, it really matters. Um, but again, we'll just have to wait and see, um, you know, the races haven't been called, but we also do not, we want to also remember why she has to show up and do the job the, the, of how much energy just by her being there is going to produce uh, in people um, all across the country. And it can have an effect overseas as well. Thank you. Um, we're already a little bit over time. I have one more question for you, and I'm not going to ask you who's going to win uh, because you don't want to do hypotheticals, but give us your take. Um, how long is this going to take and how is this going to play out um, over the next hours, the next days, or are we looking at the next couple of weeks? Uh, Derek, why don't you start? Oh, I'm not muted. Okay, great. Um, you know, <laughs> we've all been covering this all week, so I think we all have a great idea of this because we've been covering it, looking at this nonstop. I will say, it looks like, I mean, Michigan, Pennsylvania says that they're going to have, they might have a vote total tonight. And the trend there has been going toward Biden's way because Democrats largely voted by mail. He's running up the score on mail-in votes. That's all that's left. And the only ones left are in the Democratic hub. So you have uh, Allegheny County and in Philadelphia. And so that looks good for Biden. So, I mean, we can have something tonight. I don't think this is going to drag on for weeks and weeks. I really don't because yeah, Biden has the path to victory that Trump does not. Like we said, he's got to run up the score and, well, excuse me, uh, run the table, I should say, getting my metaphors confused. He's got to run the table. And it, it's, it, as the numbers come in, it looks increasingly likely that he can't do that. But, you know, we'll have to see what the votes what the votes look like. But I mean, if Pennsylvania comes tonight for Biden, that's it. Uh, uh Yeah, uh, you know, I, I agree. And piggybacking off of uh, Derek, uh, I will say that, you know, even if we were to have a projected winner tonight or a projected winner tomorrow, uh, you know, votes are still, still have to be certified. Um, and different states have different rules on how they certify things. Uh, there's going to be re-canvases and um, there will be calls for recounts. 
So, you know, for me, you know, we may have a projection. Could that change? Maybe. Could it change? Possibly not. Um, but uh, officially, when, we, when you will know who the president-elect will be officially, officially, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that could be December. Uh, just depend because different states have different rules. And uh, but could we have a projection soon? You know, all of us here are, are hoping so, because <laughs> um, yeah. we've had a lot of sleepless, <laughs> a lot of sleepless and naps. Uh, we would hope that it would come, but um, I believe it's is it Arizona or Nevada that said that they won't do another batch until tomorrow night at nine o'clock p.m. Eastern time. Uh, so right. you know, you know, we we just have to see. But if Pennsylvania pulls through and it's just wide out by the margins, I mean, it's you know, it's 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 it's, it's game at that point. Okay, uh, Michelle? Um, yeah, I agree. I do, one thing that has me a little hung up and concerned just from like a managing work hours standpoint is <laughs> um, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know what President Trump can do legally that he's talked about. Like what sorts of lawsuits would stand in court? What judges would allow those lawsuits to go forward? Um, he just was on TV saying that he is definitely going to take this all to the Supreme Court. I don't even know if you can like skip courts like that. So I think that to me is, is the big question. Um, yeah. Legal challenges, like what happens with those? How quickly will they go? How many of them will there be? I think for me, that's the big question. Okay. Uh, so there's a lot of legal challenges uh, already. Has been there in 2000. Where are we going to go from here? Yeah, uh, I remember running around Miami-Dade County and there was a guy running down the hallway with ballots in a big recycling bin and another guy chasing him. And that was right before Thanksgiving. So I'm with Chandeliers. I think um, to be sure, yes, a projection could be made in the next couple of days. But a projection is just that. Remember, they are recounting in Wisconsin already. That's a, There's a recount demand there. That's going to take a little time. It's all going to come down to numbers. If it's close, in other words, if, if Biden just gets 270, 273 electoral votes, then there's going to be challenges and it'll be a legal fight. If he can run the table, I think as Derek mentioned, if he wins Georgia, Pennsylvania, Arizona, Nevada, it's a moot point what happens in Wisconsin, just like in 2016. Remember, Wisconsin was real close and Hillary, not Hillary, but the Libertarian or the Green Party candidate Jill. challenged it. OK, but it's a moot point because even if Wisconsin would have lost, Trump still had it. So I think it's going to come down to the numbers. I think the best thing for Biden would be to run the table and that would put a, a squelch and everything. But otherwise, I'm saying December 9th, December 10th, when the mm. canvassers have to say, yeah, this is it. Very specific. <laughs> Okay, thank yeah. you. We'll, we'll off on this, and if it goes that long, we could do another uh, speaker series in, in <laughs> right before Christmas. But I'd like to thank all uh, four of you. Thank you so much uh, for spending uh, time with us. It's always, as I said in the beginning, it's always great to bring our alumni back and, uh, and, and hear from you and hear about the great careers um, that you are having. But uh, let not only me say that, uh, I hope our namesake doesn't mind if I if I read out a chat message that, uh, that he sent, uh, Dick Roberts, and he said, I'm so impressed by these grads and have never been more proud to have my name associated with the school, Dick Robertson, who graduated in 1967. Um, That's very nice. The predecessor of the- Very Robertson. sweet, thank you so much. So, thank you so much uh, for, for spending this time with us in an incredibly busy time for you. Uh, I know how busy this is, so, so we're really grateful. Thank you so much to our audience um, for uh, spending an hour with us uh, while the president is speaking, while ballots are being counted. It's definitely going to be um, uh, an interesting time um, from here on out. To our students, uh, stay focused. Um, it's three more weeks to the end of the semester. Um, don't let the presidential <laughs> election derail your studies. Um, you're almost there. And uh, for everybody, please stay healthy and stay safe and, uh, and have a wonderful holiday season. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Great. Later.